be some of the lights in front here. And um, I'll start with the baby in frontal position and we're going to turn around the heart and then look at the important landmarks. If you want you to be more comfortable sitting over there, it's not comfortable for you to be looking. So, the first thing to see is that the right ventricle is the most anterior chamber. You can see the great vessels. We have the main pulmonary and the aortic arch here. And you see that they crisscross. They are at an angle together. However, a little further here, they are going to be joining at the level of the ductus. So if you take a picture and you see the two vessels in parallel, don't be confused with a transposition of the great arteries. We talk about the vessel crisscrossing at the exit of the heart, but not a few centimeters down the road. Another thing you can see also here are the atrial appendages. This is the right and this is the left. You can also see that the uh, pulmonary artery here are more synthetic than the pulmonary veins. By the way, don't waste your time taking pictures. I will show you how you can get the whole lecture for free. You can download the whole lecture so you don't have to spend time taking pictures. Notice also that there is nothing between the aortic arch and the main pulmonary. If you see something between the aorta and the pulmonary, you have a baby that has a problem. And there's also nothing between the aortic arch and the subvenar cava. If you see something there, this is a problem. So if we turn the heart, this is the ductus arteriosus between the pulmonary and the aortic arch. And here we have the left atrium, which is the most posterior cardiac chamber. And underneath here, you can see the ductus venosus here entering the left hepatic vein just as it's posterior. Now, here we have the left atrium, we have the pulmonary arteries here, and then in between the left atrium and the left ventricle, we have a big vein that turns the heart. This is the coronary sinus. If you turn on the right side, we have the ductus arteriosus again. And here from the right side, you can see the pulmonary. And the right pulmonary has, you know, has three branches. It has a right upper lobe branch, it has a right middle lobe, and it has a right lower lobe. And this is an interesting thing because if you can see the trifurcation of the pulmonary, you know the baby has a three lobe lung, which is difficult to see. But if you're looking at it, Heterotaxis syndrome, and we'll look at that tomorrow. You can try to recognize what is a left and a right arm. Now, behind the, the supervenar cava here, you have the azygous arch. In my model here, the azygous arch is a bit thin, and the fetus is bigger than that. So now let's look at the cardiac valves, and I'm going to melt the heart so you can see inside the heart the four different valves. At the outflow, we have the semi-lunar valves, and they include the pulmonic, or pulmonary, as I want to call it, and the aortic valve. Notice that the pulmonic valve is almost outside the heart. There is no cardiac structure surrounding the pulmonic valve, while the aortic valve is more inside the heart. Now, if you look inside the heart itself, you have the tricuspid valve, which has three leaflets, septal leaflet, anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet. The anterior leaflet has a papillary muscle which is parallel to the interventricular septum, as you can see there. So when you see an image where you have two lines parallel to each other, the anterior leaflet, and you know that you're making a section which is high in the right ventricle, because that's where the anterior leaflet is. Now, most importantly, you have a septal leaflet. You know that you can identify the ventricles by looking at the atrium, because the right atrium sometimes connects to the left ventricle and vice versa. So you cannot use the atrium to organize the ventricle, but you can use the atrioventricular valve. The tricuspid valve is always in the right ventricle. 
because it was created by a mechanism of undermining of the end of the argument. So, pay attention to this septal leaflet. On the left side, there are only two pepper muscles, and you see that both of them are attached to the free wall of the left ventricle. So, no septal insertion on the left side. And notice also that each peripheral muscle has coated tendinae that go to the anterior and posterior leaflet. So it's not one peripheral muscle for one leaflet and the other peripheral muscle for the other. They attach to both. So now let's look at what you see in the cephalocodal views. First we have the unit arch with the break of cephalic arteries. Nothing between the aorta and the superior cava. When we go down below, we have the cross of the aortic arch. A little further down, we have the main pulmonary that divides it to the right pulmonary, left, and the ductus. So the big vessel you see behind the ascending aorta is the right pulmonary. So I show you how to pay attention to all these details when you look at the next one. If we go further, we have the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve, and behind that we have the left atrium. Now the left atrium has this little indentation that you can see here. This indentation is the result of the confluence of the pulmonary venous sac and the left atrium. If you go back to embryology, and when I was a medical student I hated embryology, but now I had to study it. If you go back to embryology, all the veins always return to the right atrium. So why do the pulmonary vein return to the left atrium? Well, if you look at the lungfish, lungfish were a fish that were kind of going in brackish water and they had not that oxygen. The lungfish are the first one to have pulmonary veins that go into the backside of the left atrium. And progressively, maturations develop pulmonary veins that go over here. So that vein that was going to the right atrium now goes to the left atrium. And sometimes you will see a little membrane in between this, sort of that. Sometimes you will see a little membrane between the two, and I'll show you some ultrasound images of that. And when you go further down, you have the mitral valve here, with the anterior leaflet here, and the posterior leaflet there. This is the trichotric valve, you can see the septal insertion here. And in the apex of the right ventricle, you can see the moderator band. Now also look at the interventional septum. The interventrical septum on the four chamber view appears as a mind, but actually it's a curve. The interventrical septum is curving over the left ventricle, unless you have transposition of the great artery. In the transposition of the great artery, the interventrical septum is more a straight plane. Here again, the moderator bands. And now we move to the frontal views. And in the frontal views, again, the first section you're going to see is the right ventricle. And then you can see the moderator band, the trichotric valve, the septal insertion. And here we have something interesting. You see the right ventricle, which we just saw in the previous image, is not connected directly to the pulmonary. There is something in between the right ventricle and the pulmonary called the right ventricular artful tract, RVOT. I usually avoid abbreviation, but this is one that I use often. We also talk about an LVOT, a left ventricular flow track. But you'll see it does not exist. This is a misnomer because the aorta is right into the left ventricle. Now look at the inflow of the blood into the trichotomy valve. The inflow here and the outflow over there. Angle. There's probably at least 60 degree, 70 degree angle between the two. And when we try to measure the PR interval, it'll be difficult to get the PR interval when we measure in the right ventricle because of that, because you'll get a good inflow signal but a poor outflow signal. This is the reason we usually get the uh, PR interval in the left ventricle. And I discussed the PR interval later on. So here we get into the left ventricle, and you see the aura is right into the left ventricle. So there's really no outflow tract, just a tiny segment over here. Again, nothing between the aura, nothing within the ductus, and between the superior cava. 
and you see that the inflow into the left ventricle and the outflow into the ura are almost in opposite direction. So you have a good inflow and outflow signal. Now, in the lateral views, there's really nothing interesting. Only thing you can see here is the, 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 the ductal arch, and then right behind that, the aortic arch. But nothing very interesting. So, how do we identify the different structures? Well, the first thing is the right atrium, and you identify it because this is where the vena cava are returning. So, if you do the right cable plane that I'll show you later, you should see both vena cava arriving in the right atrium. The exception to that is the persistent left of the vena cava. The persistent left of the vena cava is on the left side of the chest. And when we talk about the three vessel view, I'll show you what it looks like. Now, how do we identify the right ventricle? Many information. First, you have the moderator band at the apex of the right ventricle. This is diastole, this is systole, and the moderator band is over here. Notice also that it makes the right ventricle look shorter than the left ventricle. You have the septal insertion of the tricuspid valve over here, and you have the annulus of the tricuspid valve. It's closer to the apex than the annulus of the mitral valve. Because of that, there is an offset between the two annulus. You see that difference at the yellow arrow. If the two AV valves were at the same level, what would be the cardiac anomaly? You do four check of you, and you do AV valve at the same level. Atrial ventricular defect. This is the incomplete form of atrial ventricular defect. So pay attention to that. This is a big clue. Notice also that the right ventricle is shorter than the left ventricle. We use that when we talk about the uh, added transposition. And then this is not a reliable criteria, but the cardiac chamber closest to the chest wall in the normal previous is the right ventricle. Now the left atrium you identify because it has the pulmonary veins. You see the pulmonary vein returning to the left atrium, and that's always true unless the baby has an anomalous pulmonary venous return, which can be to the right side, which is the cardiac form, which can be to an innominate vein that goes into the uh, left supra cava, and that is the supracardiac form. Or it goes to a vessel that goes into the liver, this is the infracardiac form. So the three forms of animalist progressive return. And always look when you do the four chamber at the position of the pulmonary veins. The next thing you can identify the left atrium is that the foramen of the flap, this little thin line here, is in the left atrium. And that's always true unless two things happen. Either you have an ostium secundum atrial septal defect, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. In an ostium secundum uh, atrial septal defect, this flap is missing. That's how you make the diagnosis. The second uh, condition is when you have a severe left sided obstruction. Let's assume that you develop eoic atresia. In eoic atresia, the blood will not come out of the ura it will not come out of the left ventricle, it will regurge into the left atrium and will have to go to the right atrium to exit. Therefore, the blood going from the left to the right will push the formula wave flap on the other direction and you won't have the formula wave flap on the left atrium. So these are the three exceptions to recognizing the left atrium. The left ventricle is essentially everything different from the right ventricle. It forms the apex, it's the longest one. It is posterior, it's closer to the spine, and it has the mitral valve, which is offset compared to the tract. So, very simple. Now, how do you recognize the ductus arteriosus from the aura? Well, the ductus arteriosus has no vessels arising from it, except that from some time to time, in some sections, you can see the left subclavian artery appearing to come from the ductus. It's actually coming from the uric arch, but because of the slight thickness, it appears to come from the ductus. So don't get confused by that. That's a normal finding. The ductus has a hockey stick curve. It has a sharp angle here. Compare 
to the aura. And also it arrives close to the anterior chest wall because it comes from the right country. This is the aura, and you see the aura arise at mid-distance between the chest wall and the spine. Pay attention to that because I will show you some example in which it allows you to recognize easily an anomaly. And the anomaly here is transposition of the great artery. If you have a detransposition, the aura, instead of arising in the middle of the chest, will arise right behind the chest wall. Now let's look at the axis of the heart. If you trace a line from the sternum to the spine, the interventricular septum is at about a 45 degree angle. From time to time, that angle is deviated to the left side and the heart is more horizontal than normal. And this is very typical of conotrophal anomalies. What is a conotrophal anomaly? And now the other great vessels. Okay, so we'll, we'll go over that. And then also you're going to have left axis deviation in epstein anomaly because the right chambers are so much bigger. Conversely, you're going to have a right axis deviation in which the heart is more corrected in the midline. And that occurs in sinus inverses, in the heterotaxis syndrome, ventricular inversion, atrioventricular septal defect, double-eyed right ventricle, and common atrium. So an anomalous. Don't bother memorizing that, you can just look it up. So, with this we have reviewed the anatomy, so let's look at the cardiac chambers. And I'm sure that all of you do the four chambers, so I'm going to skip a little bit of that to have more time in the future. And for the four chamber, we just section the heart in such a way that we can see the two atria the two ventricles, the interventricular septum, the interatrial septum, the moderator band, the offset between the tricuspid and the mitral band. So many different things you want to see in that whole chamber. If the baby is in a synthetic position, like this, you have the heart in this position. This is the left ventricle, right ventricle, moderator band, Tracheal valve, mitral valve, right atrium, and then atrium. And this is where it goes. And I'm sure you have seen many of those pictures, so I'm going to go a bit rapidly. <coughs> Notice the offset between the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. You see this little gap here, which is just underneath the ascending aorta. Okay, so important to recognize the moderated band. What is this white line here? This is the pepper muscle of the anterior leaf and the tricuspid valve. Okay. Here the baby has turned a little bit. Now the spine is on the mother's right side. You have all these same findings over here. And on the video clip, the same thing. Mitral valve, tricuspid valve, offset. You see the pulmonary veins over here. You see the femoral body flap in the left atrium. This is a normal example. Another example, and. You see the moderate band over here, the offset, firm in the body of flat, and so on and so on. Now, I'm going to skip that. Here are two babies, one in cephalic position and one in bridge position. You see that in the baby in cephalic position, the apex of the heart is on the left side of the screen, while in the baby in the bridge position, the apex of the heart is on the right side of the screen. This is something that confuses young physicians often. They have a trouble organizing the head, the baby, inside the mother. So this is the normal position of each of these two fetuses. So let's go over a different situation. If the baby is on the right side of the mother, the spine on the right side of the mother, and the baby is in bridge position, the apex of the heart, being on the left side of the fetus, is going to be away from the transducer. So here you have the apex of the heart, far from the transducer. If the baby stays on the right side but is now in cephalic position, now the left side is in front and so you have the apex close to the transducer. If the baby is in the same cephalic position but now with the spine on the mother's left side, the apex will be away and if the baby is in bridge position, the apex will be close to the transducer. 
Now this is something you have to have practice over and over again so that when you look at the baby in just a few seconds you can identify the position of the baby and the position of the sinus of the baby which will go after that. I always scan from the pubis to the umbilicus when I start by scanning as I show you and now I know the position of the baby, the position of the heart inside the baby, I know the baby is alive and I know that if I were to measure the finger, I'm going to be looking over here, not here, not here, not anywhere else. That saves time, and I'm sure that in Vietnam you don't have too much time either, so you want to save time. So practice doing this over and over until it's intuitive. Now, where does the order descend? Well, here we have the heart, and you see nothing between the aorta and the pulmonary. Here we have the trachea, and behind we have the esophagus, and now we have the descending aura at this level. So normally the aura should be on the left side of the trachea. So some of you have been raised in the countryside, and you've got the chickens or turkeys. You know that in birds, the aura is on the right side of the trachea. In mammalian, the aura is on the left side of the trachea, and the is on the right side. Many of these birth defect, actually the normal situation in different species. But we have to have the aura on the left side of the trachea, and the descending aura has to be on the left side of the midline. If it's not on the left side of the midline, look for a baby that has a cardiac anomaly. You can also have the descending aura on the right side, and the descending aura on the left side, or the descending aura on the right side of the trachea, and the descending aura on the left side. So there are four possible combinations, and you have to look for a cardiac anomaly if you have a variation. So this is the normal descending aura on the left side of the midline. This is a baby whose aura is on the midline, and here's a baby whose aura is on the right side of the midline. So what do you see abnormal in this view here? What is wrong in this view? You scan this baby, and you say, oh, oh, this baby has, it has deviation of the axis, exactly. You see the left, the left axis deviation. You see the integral receptor here is perpendicular to the anterior posterior line. You have left axis deviation and right descending aura. What is the cardiac anomaly of this baby? This is a baby that has a conotropical anomaly at the foot of other lines. Remember I show you that left axis deviation is associated with chronotropic anomaly and why the aura is also. So if this is baby, you have to find the diagnosis. Don't say, oh, this is a force chamber with you, it's normal. This baby has a big problem that has to be investigated. So a little bit of anatomy, I'm going to skip a lot of this here because I want to spend some time on some more complicated things. Here we have the septal leaf flat, easy to recognize. And your leaf at the microcarl. Now when you do the four chamber view, look at the thickness of the free wall or the right ventricle, free wall or the left ventricle, and integral perceptor. All these should be the same thickness. And the two ventricles should be the same size, almost. The right ventricle can be slightly bigger, up to 20% bigger than the left ventricle. Very different from the adult and the pediatric. Now, also notice that the left ventricle often appears more smooth, less trabriculation on the left ventricle than on the right ventricle. But that's a difficult criteria to use. What is this black line here around the heart? Peripheral fluid? Any other? Yeah, this is cartilage, okay? Watch out. A black line around the heart is not necessarily peripheral fluid. Peripheral fluid will start at the AV group over here. So watch out for the universal cartilage. <coughs> now, more important, when you do the four chamber, you go just a little bit below the four chamber, you can see the coronary sinus. This is the coronary sinus over here, over here, and over there. And the reason you want to pay attention to the coronary sinus is you want to see whether it's too big. <coughs> If you have a baby that has a persistent left supranacara, which I mentioned to you before, 95% of persistent left supranacara drain into the coronary sinus. 
which is no big deal because this is Venus blood going to the coronary sinus, going to the right atrium. So this is Venus blood going to the venous side of the circulation. 5% of that will be training into the back side of the left atrium, and this is an admixture lesion. You will have deoxygenated blood contaminating oxygenated blood. So these will have a problem. Now, in the situation in which this goes to the right side of circulation, one child that persistent left is associated with heterotaxy syndrome. So, pay attention to that because the baby may have some other cardiac anomalies. So, look at the big veins draining into them. Okay, so when you do the color doctor, you want to see the inflow into both ventricles should be about the same intensity. And you can see the pulmonary veins over here, we'll just keep on to that. So once you have identified the full chamber, what do you want to do? Well, first you want to identify the right and the left atria and ventricles, the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, the interventricular and interatrial septum. You want to see the descending aorta. You want to look at the pulmonary veins. How many of you look at the pulmonary veins every time you do a full chamber? <coughs> Only one person, two person? Okay, homework for when you go back to work next Monday. You have to see the pulmonary veins every time you do a full chamber. This is, it takes a microsecond when you have practice it, but you have to do it. Then I think you want to also make sure that the ventricles are squeezing, that they are both moving, not simply one is moving and the other one is squeezing, because that's always a trouble. You want to see that they are both squeezing. And you want to see how they look consistently in diastole. Now, very often the heart beats too fast for me to see everything. So I take a video clip and then I play the video clip slower because I cannot see all the information at normal speed. So your machine can do that. Take advantage of that feature. In breast steel, you want to see that the apex is on the same side as the senior. The full right ventricle is tight here to the long left ventricle. The moderated band is in the right ventricle. The tricuspid valve is more apical than the mitral valve. Equal thickness of all the walls. The framing are very flat into the hip atrium. Pay attention to the framing are very flat. If you don't see it, the baby has atrial septal defect. Must have scan it, okay? Pulmonary veins returning to the left atrium. No vessels behind the left atrium, aside from the aorta. And the azipus, if you look carefully. And the aorta should be on the left side of the midline. And the axis of the internal septum should be at 45 degrees from the midline. If you don't have this routine in your mind, make a copy of this next to your monitor, and then check mark everything. And you do this for 15 seconds, and after that, it will become a routine. So, pay attention for at least 15 seconds. In real time, you want to see that they have equal motion on both sides. In Doppler, you want to see there's no ventricular defect. How many of you do car Doppler every time you do a four chamber? Good to front <laughs> uh, speakers here. Yeah. Okay, you have to do car Doppler if your machine has it on every four chamber, otherwise you could convince the French person for the event. You want to see that there is a similar signal in uh, systole and diastole, and there is no significant target of representation. So, with that you have completely done the four chamber, you want to go into the left heart views, and you can do either a central or a transverse approach. So, this is what we had in the full chamber. I was going for the apex of the heart and the mitral valve, and now I'm going to oblique the plane. So I go for the apex of the heart and the uric valve. So I'm going to do a section that goes from the mitral valve to the uric valve. So it's a steeper angle. And you can do this either in a central section, like this, in which the ureter is kind of sandwiched between the right ventricle and the left atrium. See the ureter in between. And in that view, you don't see the right atrium. You see the right ventricle is here, left atrium, the left ventricle, ascending you up, but you don't see the right atrium. So that tells you this is a cerebral section. This one is in diastole. How do I know that? It's written here, but what on the picture tells me this is diastole? You see, you see the uric valve. So if the uric valve is visible inside the uric, 
it has to be in the middle. If it's in the middle, it has to be closed, so it has to be rise. Okay. What is this vessel here? Behind the ascending order. This is the right priority. Remember, this is an important landmark to recognize. So here we have the sexual reversion of the ambiguity. Here okay. you see the frame on a very flat flipping over here. The other technique is simply to stop at the four chamber, this is what we have, and then you continue and you complete the section a little bit more, and then you go from the four chamber to the left half of the track, which is the easiest thing to do because it's the same motion, you just extend it. And in that EQ, you're going to be showing the left ventricle, the unit bar, or sending your and now you can see the right atrium. You see the right atrium is visible here with the tractable valve. And this little white dot here is the septal insertion of the tractable valve. So this is what you see in this view. Same thing a bit faster. Now, let me introduce to you the ballerina foot. When you look at the left half of the track, you want to see the left ventricle as the foot of the ballerina and the ascending aura as the leg. And this should be aligned anatomically. Compare this view here with this view here. You see the foot over here, you see the leg over here, and you see that the leg here has an odd angle. There's a break here. The leg here is not facing the foot. The leg here is facing the interventricular septum. And in that position, it is an overriding aura. So here you have the tertiary fellow or any other overriding condition. So pay attention to the difference between one and the other. So here we have left and foot track, and there are two things you want to see in each one of those sections. You want to see that the anterior wall of the aura is in direct continuity with the anterior ventricular receptor. Anterior ventricular receptor over here. If it's not, the baby has transposition, or it has a double eyelid right ventricle, or it has trilogy fellow. So this continuity you have to see. The second thing you want to see is that the posterior wall of the aura here is in direct continuity with the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. Okay? Otherwise the baby has transposition. So this is an important thing to once you have done that, you have done the whole left side, and you can go to the left to right speed. So, what you do is, either in a central section, go from left to right, or more comfortably, you just extend the view you had before, from the left upward track to the right upward track, which is over here. And that's an important section because now you can see both left and right. This is the left upward track with the beginning of the arch, and here you can see we go from left to the right upper track. Okay? So you can see very well the crisscrossing of the two upper tracks at this level. So here we have a right upper track and you have the other arch over here. Now remind me when I scan, I want to show you how to hold the transducer. I see many people holding the transducer like this. They put some fingers in front of the transducer and some fingers behind the transducer. And when you do that, what you're doing is locking the transducer in your hand, and if you want to move, you have to move the wrist. And the wrist is not a very precise motion. What I want you to do is instead of that, hold the transducer between two fingers, and now I can rotate the transducer, and with the other finger, I can angle the transducer. That is a much more precise way of holding the transducer. And one of the problems that people have when they start to feel echo is when they try to go from one echo track to the other, they go from the thymus to the stomach and back and forth, and they go to the middle. So don't use your wrist for motion, always use your fingers for the motion. Here we have the left upper track here. So you see there's a very tiny amount of motion between one and the other. So here's what it look like, right, left, and so on and so forth. So I'll show you when we do the demonstration a little later on. Same thing, and you go all the way to the three vessel view from the four chamber and the left half of the track. Now you can go into the right heart views, and you can do this in a central way, 
And the only interest here is to show the whole yearly arch, remember the whole ductal arch. Or you can just stop at the sweep that you were doing, and then you have all the information in the right part view. And when you do this, you see you're very high in the heart, you're very close to the three vessel view, and you have almost no heart left in the image. So we're very close to the base of the heart at this level. You can see the left alpha track, you can see the, uh, the left boom artery, and here you can see the aura surrounded by the main boom artery going to the ductus, to the descending aura. The ascending aura is over here. This is the right boom artery, super red cava, and it has this arch behind it. And then ultimately, you end up at the three rest of the view. And that is a very useful picture. You have a line and then two dots. The line represents the main boom artery. The first dot is the ascending aura. The second dot is the super red cava. Now, notice that all these three vessels are not exactly aligned, but they are almost aligned at the front. So if you trace a line that goes from the main pulmonary to the supernacava, the aura is almost touching it. Not exactly touching it, but almost touching it. What is this here? This gray thing here. Right lung, left lung, thymus, exactly. So, when you do the three vessel view, you have to see that the thymus is in front. If the three vessel view here was moved closer to the chest wall, the thymus would be absent. So, this baby has the George syndrome, the macrodeletion. Okay? So, not only you want to look at the alignment, but you want to see at what is in front compared to the uh, vessel. Also, notice the difference between the size of the ascending aura and the size of the descending aura. What, what is that such a big difference between the ascending aura and the descending aura? Because between the ascending aura and the descending aura, the circulation has already lost the circulation to the brachycephalic arteries and to the coronal artery. So 16 and 18 percent of the blood flow has gone away. So by the time you get to the descending aura, there is less blood that is available. So this is the three vessel trait view. You have the three vessels aligned over here, and I'll show you some more example in just a second. So you see one line, a dot, and a dot. Now there are two versions of this view. This line dot dot, and the version where you can see the two arches touching. I'm going to change the picture and look carefully. There will be almost no difference. You see this image here and this image here. This is the conference of the two arches. This is a normal view, and don't look at this and say, oh, the vessels are narrow, so the baby has transposition. Remember, this is not transposition. This is just a normal conference. Okay, so be careful about that. Do we see a line in the dot dots? Here, we have something that looks like a skateboard. Huh? So this is a very different situation. This is a baby that has transposition of red artery. And the other artery is underneath. So this is usually the aura and the pulmonary is below that. So you see the aura, supernacava, and trachea. Okay. Line and then one dot. We're missing a dot and there's a big gap. So the missing dot is the aura. You don't see it, you're in the trachea. Okay, so many things to look when you do the three vessel view. Remember, I told you that in birds, the aura is on the right side, but in mammalian, it's on the left side. So when you do the three vessel view, you should see pulmonary, aura, supernacava, and the trachea is behind the aura. It's not in between the aura and the pulmonary, it's behind the aura. Look at the difference here. The trachea is in between the ductus and the ascending aura. So this is a right aortic arch. And this is the U form, that two form, a V shape and the U form of right ear arch. So, this baby, when it's going to be delivered, what would be the problem? Exactly, it has trouble breathing because his trachea is encircled. So, this baby needs to be delivered in the big hospital where they can take care of it. Let's get this one. Now, 
This is the thymus in front, so don't get confused with this being a thymoma or something like that. This is just a normal thymus. Very important, when you do the three vessel view, you always want to put card armor. And you want to do your three vessel view as much as possible, either for a front approach or from a back approach. The reason for that is that if you do a three vessel view collar in the front approach, the blood flow in the ductus and the blood flow in the aorta would be both in the same direction. They will be forward flow, so if you look from the front, they both will be blue. If you look from the back, they both will be uh, red. So, important to recognize that. Let's assume you have a blue vessel and a red vessel. What's happening there? If the ductus is in blue, but the aura is in red, it means that the blood in the aura is going backwards. If the blood is going backwards, it means that the baby has an aortic stenosis, or atresia in fact, and the blood is returning backwards to go to the coronary arteries. So always look at one versus two color when you do the three vessel view. Also look for turbulence. If you see some turbulence in the uh, three vessel view, the baby has probably a stenosis in that uh, valve. If you go a little higher, you have the innominate vein, and if you look behind the trachea, you can often see these appendages as a normal finding too. More innominate vein, so it means that you are too high in the field of the chest, almost in the field of the neck. So this is a three vessel view. You see the innominate here. You see the supranacula with the azimuth arch behind. You see the two main stem bronchi here because once you're below the trachea, you see the main stem bronchi, and this is the normal three vessel view. Here we have the right of the track. For you some images here. So we have right ventricle, right alpha track, the pulmonary, the ductus, ascending aura, the right pulmonary, ascending aura. Okay? This is supervena cava, this is azicus arch. You see, azicus arch is a big finding in the fetus, and there behind, we don't have the trach anymore, but we have the left main stem bronchus and the right main stem bronchus. And behind that, we have the acidus uh, vein. And if you follow the uh, main pulmonary, the right pulmonary, you can see the right upper lobe here, you can see the right middle lobe, and here you can see the right lower lobe. So here you can all three of the branches of the right pulmonary. And here this is carina between the left and the right and the bronchus. This is normal funny too. Pay attention to that. You can see the two main stem bronchi at this level. So, fundamentally, what I have told you up to now to do is the grand sweep. You start with the four chamber, you do all the measurements you need in the four chamber. Once you have done that, you extend your section a little bit higher. You have the left outflow track, move to the right outflow track, and move to the three rest of you. And if you can do that properly and the baby is cooperating, in 10, 12 seconds, you have eliminated 99.9% .9 of the cardiac anomalies. So this is a very efficient way to do the scanning. So you start the four chamber, move to the left outflow track, move to the right outflow track, before you have the shadow, and then you have the three vessel here. So you have all the information you need to get in one street. Again, you can do this at high speed or slow down the clip. I think it's easier to slow me down the clip. Now, aside from these fundamental views, there's a few other views that we don't use all the time but are useful to have and to practice for when you need them. One is the basal short axis view, which I call the left view. I figure it with the walking because before Google existed, when you searched for something, you had to go to the yellow page, and this was the indicator of the yellow page. So here what we have is the aorta in the center, and behind you have the right atrium, track speed valve, right ventricle, Pumari valve, main pumari, ductus, and right pumari. And this is what it looks like in the image. You see the three cusps of the aortic valve over here. Behind you have the left atrium, the IVC, which, as you remember, doesn't go into the right atrium, but goes in between the right and the left atrium. 
you might have to lift the atrium of the track that you found, the right ventricle, the pulmonary valve, main pulmonary, and the ductus. Okay, this is the advantage of that is that it shows you the whole right side structure around the ura. And you can see very well that the pulmonary artery and the ura are in crisscross position. They are not in the same plane. If they were in the same plane, you would not be able to get that. Also, you can see the relative size of the pulmonary artery to the ura. If the baby had a large ura and a small pulmonary artery, what would you be thinking of? Large ura, small pulmonary artery, they try to show for Okay. Another example here, you can see the ura, the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary. Same thing here, you see the valve in the middle. And you see the synchrony of pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. And then here you can see the three cusp of the aortic uh, valve. Notice that when you do the left of your track and you measure the size of the aortic valve, it should be the same size as the ascending aorta. If you see an ascending aorta which is larger than the aortic annulus, then it's not normal. And this is a baby that had a Bacchus-pediotic valve. In a Bacchus-pediotic valve, there's a stenosis and it creates a jet phenomenon, and the jet phenomenon distends the ascending ura and gives this image here. Now, we can also look at the uric and ductal arches. I've shown this image here, it's not very important, so we can skip. And here is two babies. One of these babies is going to go home, and the other baby is going to go to surgery. Which of these baby do you send home, and which of these baby do you send to surgery? Very good. You see the difference between this baby here and that baby over there is the position of the aortic root. This aortic root arises in the mid distance between the chest wall and the uh, descending aorta. This aortic root here arises in the front of the chest. If it arises in the front of the chest, it comes from the right ventricle. If you go from the right ventricle, this baby has the detransposition of the great artery. So important to look when you do the arches to recognize one from the other. And then finally, the last view that I wanted to show you is the bicable view. So in the bicable view, we take a section here that goes for the supernatal cava and inferior cava, and you get an image like this one. This is the right atrium, this is the supernatal cava. This is inferior cava. Here we have the tricuspid valve, and above the tricuspid valve here, you see the right atrial appendage. You see, see over here, and then you have the right ventricle. Of course, that implies that the baby is in the right position. If the baby is in transverse position, you can't get the back cable view. Now, look at this image, and here the video clip. You see that we're very close to the aura. So when I move the transducer a little bit, I go from the IVC, I'm sure SVC, to the SMUR. And this is what we take advantage when we take the uh, uh, PR interval, we take advantage of this proximity. Now compare this image to this image here. We see the super cava, but the inferior cava is missing. Okay? Inferior cava is absent, we have IVC interruption, and IVC interruption is very strongly associated with left isomerism. So by making this image here, you have made an important diagnosis because this baby has a major set of cardiac anomaly and also need to be transferred to the big hospital. So this is all what I want you to show you. So we have the chamber view, four chamber view, left upper track, right upper track. We have the vessel view, the three vessel trachea view, the arches, the pulmonary vein view, which is part of the four chamber view, the back chamber view, and then we have combined views that attach the vessels to the uh, different chambers. So I have eight more minutes before we have a break. So I'm not giving my eight minutes. I'm going to start directly to the step by step because this is a very long part, and we're going to. To do this after the break. So now you know how to do the chambers, you know how to get the views, you know how to perform the exam, but 
what is the mental process? You have this baby that runs with you, and someone says, funny looking heart, please investigate. What is the first thing you want to do? Well, the first thing you want to do is look at the sinus and position of the heart, and you do this by looking at the heart, the apex of the heart, the descending aorta, and the stomach. All these have to be on the same side, and they have to be on the left side. And to do this, we'll take the same baby in cephalic position here, and we're going to make the three sections that we just looked at. We look at the high abdominal view, in which we want to look at the position of the stomach. We look at the four chamber view, and then we'll finish with a few vessel trachea. In the uh, abdominal view, we want to see that the stomach is on the left side, the descending aura is on the left side, Inferior cava is on the right side and not at the same level as the descending aura. Inferior cava is more anterior than the descending aura. At the four chamber view, all the things that we just talked about the axis of the heart, the size of the heart, and so on and so forth. And in the three vessel view, same that marks that we just saw. I don't want to bore you with that. Remember, we can do a two view version of the three vessel view the conference or the nine dot dot. So now we have everything on the left side and everything on the same side. And this is why we do this. The majority of babies that you're going to scan have the apex and the stomach on the left side. This is the common situs, and in Latin, this is called situs solitus. One every 10,000 baby, you will have a baby in which the apex of the heart is on the right side and the stomach is also on the right side. This is called a cytosine inversus. This baby is a mirror image of a normal fetus. More commonly, you will see babies that have a discrepancy in which the heart is on one side and the stomach is on the left side, and if the heart is on the right side, it's called dextrocardia. And from time to time, you see also babies that have the heart on the left side, but the stomach on the right side. And this is called visceral sinus, sinus and vigorous, many different names. Why does this matter? Well, the prevalence of cardiac anomaly in sinus solidus is 1%. So you scan 100 patients, one out of this baby will have a cardiac anomaly. So if you do some statistics on your accuracy, you have to pay attention to that. You have to have about 1% baby that have a cardiac anomaly. In sinus reverses, so the baby is a mirror image. This is the uh, hedgehog gene. You can know that this baby will have more cardiac anomaly, and they have twice as many cardiac anomaly, 2%. But 2% of 1 per 10,000, that doesn't make much of a difference. Where the money is, is in visual sinus. Here, 75 to 84 percent of these babies have a cardiac anomaly, and in dextrocardia, over 95 percent of these have a cardiac anomaly. And this is very practical because if all do four chamber view, you do a abdominal section, and I want you to do an image split in two, and on one side of the image you put the four chamber, on the other side you put the stomach. So it's easy for you to see that if they are not on the same side, on the same side. You have to find the anomaly, or you have to find an appointment for this patient to see someone who will find the anomaly. So here we have a patient. This is at 3 o'clock in the morning. The patient has some cramping. And this is the finding. Who sends her home, and who sends her for further investigation? Who says, go home? Who says, more investigation? <laughs> go home and come back to go morning for further investigation. This is correct. This apex and this stomach are on the same side. Okay? And you see from this image that that same side is next to the transducer. Okay, not away from the transducer, next to the transducer. Since the spine is on the left side of the mother, that side here is the right side of the baby. So this baby has <coughs> sinus inverses. Okay? So this is a baby you want to investigate further. 
Now that it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you want to do a full scan the next day morning. This baby has the stomach on the left side, but the apex is on the middle. What's wrong with this cardiac view here? I mentioned to you before. Yeah, it has right axis deviation and something more. Show me with your hands. If you bounce, if you bounce at the same level, atrial perceptual defects. Okay? This baby has the apex on the left side, the stomach on the right side, or the high dermis. Okay? What is the likelihood of a cardiac anomaly? 75%. Okay? Now, a few tricky definition. I've shown you the normal baby, and I've shown you the baby that had dextrocardia. There's one more baby. That baby here has dextro position. So now the heart is on the right side of the chest, but not because the heart has a problem, because something else is either pushing or pulling on the heart to the right side. And here I made a drawing of a diaphragm hernia pushing the heart to the right side. Dextro position, the baby's heart usually don't have cardiac anomaly. Dextro cardia, 95% of these have a cardiac anomaly, so it's important to recognize this distinction. Okay, so now it's 2.30, we have a short break. Uh, Uh, and uh, informative uh, lectures.